We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Well, thank you very much all for being here. Welcome to this session. Good afternoon from Barcelona. But good morning and good evening to all of you who are reaching out from the different corners of the world. I am Maria Galindo. I am Director General for Digital Nation and Urban Agenda at the Government of Catalonia. And I will be moderating this session with my colleague Arnau Serra, who is also connected somewhere. So, uh, We've seen this short video. Digitalization poses big opportunities for all of us, for social development, for economic growth, for climate change, to tackle climate change and for a positive sustainability of our planet. But we must promote rights uh, also in the digital scene. And um, there's different stakeholders who have a lot to say in this duty, in this uh, promotion of digital rights, both from governments, from companies, from tech corporations as well, and from citizens. So today we will be reflecting on the importance of empowering citizens digitally to guarantee human rights, democracy, and privacy in the current digital era. So with uh, four panelists from the government, from the civic society from universities from international organizations uh, who will share with us what's happening what are the global challenges that we are facing and what projects are succeeding in in guaranteeing these digital rights but first of all and since the session is promoted uh, by the government of catalonia I'd like to welcome our Vice President and Minister for Digital Policy and Development, Mr. Jordi Puchnero, who will share some words with us. Dear fellow citizens of the world, it is an honor to participate in such an important event as the Internet Governance Forum. However, it is also a responsibility. From the Government of Catalonia, we promote digitalization as the key to generate opportunities across our territory. First, we promote connectivity to vertebrate social development. We believe that the best social policy is that which creates jobs. And jobs of the future will no doubt be linked to digitalization. For this reason, we focus on digital talent, digital democracy, and digital rights. Second, we aim for a digital economy and the digitalization of our economy. We are promoting innovation in digital technologies and its embracement by the whole ecosystem. Third, we aim at being digital and green as the only way forward. That's why we work to be carbon, uh, carbon neutral territory and for this we use technology to promote a connected and collective transport and new news, and news forms of developing our activities, such as hybrid work. We recently presented a pilot study we did on the environmental impact of hybrid work and turns out that one can save 25% of CO2 emissions by working from home the half time. That's equal to removing 57,000 cars from the streets a day. We do, we do this for our economic and environmental sustainability. And among all, we do this for our social sustainability. To achieve this, we are promoting an internet governance model that places the citizens and human rights at the center. As citizens, we have an active role. Everyone should be able to participate in the decision-making process that affects them. 
the digital age should facilitate the citizens' empowerment. In this respect, the Government of Catalonia coordinates the development of the Charter for Digital Rights and Responsibilities, an open innovation project that aims to define a legislative and democratic framework to guarantee human rights in the digital age. The Charter includes rights such as universal access to the internet, freedom of expression and information, digital innovation and creation, access to and distribution of knowledge, data protection, digital training and inclusion, or algorithmic governments. During this uh, workshop, you will have the opportunity to learn about projects and actions that are already happening, which respond to what is contained in the Catalan Charter for Digital Rights and Responsibilities. Thus, we will explain what the Government of Catalonia does to ensure universal access to the Internet and to promote digital talent and digital innovation. Moreover, we will show you we tackle the digital gap and that the recent pandemic has made even more apparent. Of course, we look forward to learning uh, from all of you as well. And thank you very much uh, for your interest. And of course, enjoy the session. Thank you so much, Vice President Jordi Puchnero. Uh, no doubt the endeavor is shared. And so we'll have here four panelists uh, to join in the discussion and reflection today. So first of all, let me tell you that you can participate by sending your questions, reflections, doubts, knowledge, whatever you want to share with us um, uh, through the chat that is allowed here. And you can send us questions in English, in Catalan, in Spanish, and uh, both Arnau and myself will we'll try and, and have them on the table. So let me welcome to the floor uh, Joana Barbain. Joana is Director General for Digital Society at the Government of Catalonia. She has a degree in journalism and a diploma in business sciences, and she has worked for both the public and private sectors. Her professional career has focused on digital communication and strategic and organizational consulting. So Joana, under your Directorate General, and we've heard Vice President Putnaro saying uh, how important it is to protect uh, digital rights. You've been promoting the Charter for Digital Rights and Responsibilities from Catalonia. This is being quite uh, very new and Catalonia has been one of the first countries to launch this charter. So, so tell us more about the charter. Well, hello, Maria. Hello to everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for, well, I'm glad to be here today with you. As you said, we are uh, working from the government, this Charter for Digital Rights and Responsibilities. As you know, uh, tomorrow we are celebrating the Human Rights Day all around the world. Uh, it has been more than 70 years ago that the United Nations adopted this uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It was one of, of the most important milestones in the human history. But now I think that we are also in a period of changes and challenges. We are living now so in this um, new digital age or digital era, and we need to talk about and to make some reflections about that, okay? Just, we made it seven years ago about the human rights, but I think that we need to do it right now about digital rights. And having a look here at, at the pandemic and the, the lockdown, uh, it has been further demonstrated that how ICT can improve uh, people's lives. I, I, for example, how uh, we connect with, it, with each other while we were on under lockdown, how we move, how we work. Like, I mean, that now it's important and we need to be, it's mandatory to, to having people uh, with digital competencies and we, we need to work on, on this and his rights and responsibilities because it's now on the table. This uh, direct impact on fundamental rights, I mean, the digital and, and fundamental rights that are, are between them linked. 
and we we need to to talk about uh, what is uh, algorithms, how we make all the the rules for the machines, who has my personal data, and and what they do with them or with it, um, where should be people working from home, from work, with which rights and responsibilities. Um, being from working from home, from home, that means that I should be able all, all the time, or I can, or I just can, you know, disconnect for some for some moments. So um, this is the time for for thinking about that, and also I think that the pandemic has raised the digital gaps between people and territories, and and we need to to, to fight against that. Okay, so. From the government of Catalonia, we began two years ago to lead and to coordinate the development of uh, the Charter for Digital Rights and Responsibilities from Catalonia, because we want to talk about the, these new circumstances and we want to everyone to be involved in that. And then if you want, Maria, I can just be more, I can explain what are we working, working, but I think that it was the time for, you know, for making the point on this kind of digital yeah. rights responsibilities yeah so um joanna you i think that a lot of like most of the things that you are talking about and i think that everyone is facing like these challenges so what to do with my data i go online so what happens with my data i go to work and i have this all these digital tools so so it's a bit of a like shared responsibility so do you work with a specific governance model to to yeah. to yeah, sure. We work in, in, in how we manage the project teams itself. I mean, this is, a, this is an open innovation project. It's, it's also, always under construction. It's not just a PDF or some kind, you know, word or paper uh, on the internet. It's, it's more than a, a constant work and, and it's, also, it's always working. Okay, so people from a wide variety of sectors of society, uh, I mean, activists, uh, public authorities, business, lawyers, researchers, international experts, also other governments, they, they have been contributing to the, to the charter from the first time until now. And they've been reviewed and amended in, and improved the proposals. So I, I invite, of, of course, our people who's today in this session to, to be involved in this, in this charter, but also, we are talking not only in, in building this charter, but also in how um, we need to govern, to, to make the governance of this, of this charter, okay, of the internet. I mean, one of uh, our articles of the charter, we make reference to which should be the, the, this model of governance. And the charter incorporates this, this, um, this kind of reflection. And we said, I mean, people who's working on the charter said that the exercise of, and defense of digital rights and responsibilities require a new democratic structure. I mean, it's not like government says and citizens, you know, they make things that we say. That, that we, that we say. It's, it should be a different kind of governance because the internet global governance model is based on in a multi-stakeholder collaboration. I mean, each one has to, to be um, involved in, on this project. The citizens, of course, are locally and globally governments. I mean, all the, the economy, um, the, the business economy, and, and of, co of course, the, the public authorities and all the entities. I mean, uh, entities with uh, uh, entities about, about uh, digital, uh, digital rights, okay? So we are the, uh, the, the chart, the chart uh, itself um, in, involves this kind of new governance model where everyone has to say something. It's not just... Uh, the government says and the citizens obey. Mm -hmm. I think this is the biggest like a change. Like digital is really um, um, promoting all these yeah. tools for citizen yeah. participation, for stakeholder participation. So, can you share with us what you've been done? What you are more <clears throat> like? What 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 kind of what what set of rights you are promoting and and why? What are examples of these digital rights? Yeah, I mean, it's not just the charter that it's important, but we, you can just define a charter, but then you need to make policies, you know, related to these uh, articles, because if not, it's just, you know, words. But we, we are talking about universal access to the internet. 
we are and we are making this uh, from the government uh, sure that citizens uh, of every municipality in Catalonia they should have access to high quality internet and Wi-Fi. So we are we've been we are working on having you know big cities and also both big cities and big rural areas with uh, with very few population because Catalonia, as you know, we have a lot of few villages and cities. Uh, we want to have them all connected. So this is it, for me the, the one of the um, most important points that it's to have um, universal access to internet and no, I mean any difference between people who lives around. Then also we are working in, in, a, in a network of multiple local ICT resources. So uh, all over the territory, everyone has uh, a place nearby where somebody can help them to regarding digital matters. We call them put tick, it's like a ICT point. And it's like a public service where everyone can do courses, can get help with processes with the public administration, or simple, you can just go there for using the Wi-Fi or a computer when you are not capable to do that. Okay. We are also we are also working in a, in an alliance called Barcelona Digital Talent. We made this alliance with the mobile world capital, with several local and global public institutions, with also the private institutions. And the objective, as you know, and we have a, a lack of digital talent, not in Barcelona, but in Europe and in, 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 in the world. So we are, well, we want to tackle the digital talent gap in, in order to promote this market competitiveness because, uh, you know, uh, there are a lack of, of men on, and women, of course, in, in this sector. Because we want to position Barcelona as a talent, you know, as a talent capital and to achieve this, we are committed to training and to, to doing to training digital skills and we are also working in, in reskilling and upskilling. And let me talk also about before finish um, an initiative that we are working also in Catalonia. Uh, we have one of the first ever public digital competencies certification programs. It's called ACTIC and we work in ACTIC it's um it's um Compared to the Digicom, I mean, you can get both uh, certifications uh, just having one of them. So this is our, our certificate, but it's also useful for Europe. And every year around 20,000 people get digital competencies certifications in Catalonia. In fact, this month we will reach the number of 100,000 certifications through Catalan citizens. So we are working hard on that. And for finishing, and Maria, you know, um, we are also, um, really, um, we are working hard on having more women in, in this sector. I'm leading the Pladonatic, it's the ICT woman plan, okay? And the aim is to boost and recognize the role of women in, in ICT. And we work in two ways. One of them is, um, well, we are promoting female digital entrepreneurship with training and mentoring. And, but also we, we want to recognize the fundamental role of women in the professional business and academic world of technology, but also uh, we want to, to offer references to girls and teenagers, because I, I think that um, we are a lot of women working on this kind of, in this sector, but we sometimes need to be, you know, more on the, on the floor because, well, not for us, but for the, for the environment, we, it's very difficult to, to reach these kind of positions. So this is, there are the more ways that we are working on that, but if you want, I can later talk about that. Okay, thank you so much, Joanna. So universal access to the internet and yes. then promoting also and fighting um, the competence uh, gap and yeah. skill gap, and obviously um, to get more women on board. Thank yeah. you, Joanna. So thank I you. didn't mention this, but uh, we'll have like a round of, questions with the, the four panelists and then we'll open the floor and the debate to all the panelists to talk to them and also to all the attendees. So secondly, we have uh, with us Mr. Alejandro Kemp. Uh, Alejandro is the former executive director of the Salvador Allende Foundation in Chile. And he's also the promoter of My First Vote, an NGO that contributes uh, to promoting the opinion of children and adolescents around issues that affect or interest them and through digital technologies and methodologies, but also in face-to-face -face, uh, meetings or fields, which is also very important. 
Alejandro, welcome. And um, like uh, I, I heard from you this really exciting project that you are doing in Chile. Um, tell us more about how Chilean adolescents were the worst, the ones who started uh, the social and political process of a new constitution in Chile. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, hello to, to everyone and thanks for, for this, this invitation. My command of English is not as good as we like, so I have written my intervention. I will read my apologies and uh, here, here I go. Uh, the context where all this happened has been called Chilean social outbreak. The triggering factor for these events was the increase in the rate of the Santiago public transport in something like 0.03 cents of heroes, which came into effect in October 2019. After the rate increase, thousands of high school students organized to carry out a massive evasion of the payment of the ticket in Santiago Metro. With the passing of the days, the number of evaders increased. They weren't just high school students anymore. Others began to join the evasion. The facts reached TV news program and the people without any coordination, not only evaded the payment of the Metro, but also took the street of the most important cities of the country to express their rejection of a highly unjust economic and democratic model. Men and women, olds and youngs, families, lower class, middle class, and a little of upper middle class mobilized to reject the model of the 1980 constitution, constitution of the dictator Pinochet, it is estimated that something like four and five million people mobilized without stopping day after day until the pandemic arrived. Chilean students, university and high school students have, have been historical social actors. In different moments of our republican life, they have been key in order to push democratic advance. In fact, the FESES, the biggest federation of high school students was founded in 1948, but we can already observe first form of civic organization of high school students in 1990. During its first years of life, the Federation demanded economic benefits from the state, such as reduction in the rate of transport, granting of a scholarship, creation of a technical university and change in the school curriculum. It went back to the Chilean social outbreak of 2019 and the political process that was born from it, the writing of a new constitution, Chilean high school students have been pushing and demanding change in different issues and levels by coordinating mobilizations in 2001, 2002, 2005, 6, 8, 12, 15, 16, 18, and finally in 2019. As you know, technology in 2001 was very different <laughs> to uh, 2019. So the, the, how important has been digitalization for Chilean high school students and their civic action? Technology, uh, obviously has allowed them a faster, deeper, and broader coordination of themselves. There's no doubt. It, it has allowed them to reach people who previously were unreachable for them. Example, the media, the mass media communication. But it, it has not created the vindictive spirit and their civic expression that they have shown since 1990. Social networks and mobile phones with their immense capacity were key in the management and communication of, of their action during the social outbreak, of course. But how did they do it in the 90s, the 80s, the 70s, 50s, or earlier? So, and, uh, and this is for this specific case, maybe technology is not as important as we want to believe. Chilean high school students have an historical interest in influence the social reality of their country. And for this task, they have used 
technology, always. In my opinion, the key thing is that an important part of the adult world, long before cell phones, has encouraged them in order to have a collective opinion about the reality of their country. Thank you so much, Alejandro. So um, we've seen that digitalization is important in the process. It's, it's a tool to accelerate and, and, to, and to further encourage uh, um, the participation of students, of adolescents in this older life kind of like doing. And so how, how do you see the state of the art in civic, uh, for in adolescent civic, civic participation in, in Catalonia? Because you have, like your soul is Chilean, but you are based in, in Barcelona. So yeah. how do you see how it's going in, in, in Catalonia, in Barcelona and in other parts of the world? Or what, what would the lessons be, the lessons learned from the process in Chile? Well, uh, uh, but if, if, if we talk about, about uh, adolescent civic participation in Catalonia, first, I would like to uh, have uh, very much that this question had been answered by an adolescent and not by an old man like me. I know that you, the government of Catalonia, made an effort in that direction in order to, to have a, a, an adolescent speaking here because it's, it's, this is like men talking about women no? or, or, no? or feminism. Uh, but uh, from my point of view, uh, we should fly over two aspects uh, in, 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 in this period of two years working here in, in, in Barcelona. The schools and the model of a youth council from citizen participation. Very briefly, the schools. The investigation of three Catalan researchers called Citizenship Education and Secondary Compulsory Education in Catalonia at the end of its abstract says, open quote, the aim of this work is to verify the linking between curricular statesmen and teaching directions. Documental analysis is used, specifically content and discursive analysis by emphasizing into the meaning, implicit and explicit, on citizenship on citizenship, sorry, stated curricular orientation. As well, it discusses the possible teaching consequence of these relations. One of the main results is the existence of a gap between what is stated in the per perspective and normative parts of the curriculum, almost at the level of principles, and the didactic session, close quotes. In my words, in simple words, the citizenship education in Catalonia is dead content. It's a content without practice. It's just ideas, very general, but has some, you, 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 we, we can see uh, uh, we, we can see that the school push push them. It seems that Catalan schools are, are concerned that their students learn mathematics and other subjects, but not that they do citizenship exercise. Much concern is observed that their students learn and deploy civic obligation, which are very important, obviously, but there, are no, there is no incentive for those same students to deploy collective actions in the field of the rights, rights that should operate in the different collective space that adolescents inhabit, the school, the neighborhood, the city, and the country. Like happen, uh, like happen in Chile. In not, not, not only in Chile, Chile, Argentina, and Uruguay has very, very, very deep tradition in 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 an adolescence movement. Number two, the model of councils. Uh, I will speak from the experience of our association, El Meu Primer Vote in Catalan, my first vote in English. The infant council seems to be made up of only for best students, the trunk code, you know? And what do we mean by best students? Well, the most studious, the most respectful, and the most obedient. In fact, in the council that we have worked with, there is always an adult overseeing the conversation. And it could be understood in council of children, not only very little children. 
but the same has happened to us in the Council of Adolescents. Surely uh, there are exceptions, but we believe that uh, in the model of the Council in general, the presence of adults, rather than promoting the learning and development of adolescents as free and emancipated citizens, seek to control them. In my conclusion, what do we have to do in order to change this reality is facilitate and stimulate without adult control that adolescents organize themselves, feel that they are a relevant social subject in society, not just a commercial objective. And technology is key, is key for that, for that goal. Thank you so much, Alex, Alejandro. This this is very interesting. So um, I think that for many, like this, this can serve not just for Catalonia, but for many uh, countries uh, in, in the world that uh, we must incorporate these new um, exercises, like how do I exercise my citizenship with also digital technologies in, in this uh, school curriculum, because Currently, I, I, I don't know of any place that this is being taught, like, like within the curriculum, not certainly not here. And also, I am taking note on, on the infant councils, uh, because yes, it's, it's very mainstream right now that everyone like uh, comes up with, with an infant council as to get all these voices also represented. Yeah. Yes, adults, we are always there and we are we seem to, to be controlling everything and, and actually, yes, limiting this capacity of infants to participate. Thank you so much, Alejandro. And I, I'd like to introduce a third panelist, uh, Dr. P Christina Coakley. Christina is founder of the new, of the Why Not Lab, sorry. And she's a member of the steering committee of the Global Partnership on AI and a member of the advisory committee of the new Carnegie Council Program, AI and Equality Initiative. In addition, she is a member of the OECD expert group on AI and is affiliated with the Center for Labor Relations Research at the University of Copenhagen. Christina, be very welcome. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. We've been discussing a lot about rights and uh, citizen participation in, in all the process. And I know that um, when, when involving citizens, when involving workers, we have the data issue here. And I've I've heard you before saying related to data that data should not be a commodity or data is not a commodity that we can buy and sell. Mm -hmm. So given your experience advising international organizations and unions, do you think GDPR uh, sufficiently protects workers' data rights? Mm -hmm. Thank you for that question. And and it's, <laughs> no <laughs> is the short <laughs> answer of uh, the long response. Uh, and and the reason why in a global context that that this is also interesting is the GDPR is the data protection regulation that includes most mm -hmm. workers' data rights. But still, we can want for more. And I think this relates very very much to your charter here. And one of the things which uh, then feeds into human rights, and I'll come back to that in a minute. One of the things that the GDPR does not sufficiently cover workers on is knowledge about when we are subject to algorithmic inferences, so profiles, predictions, probability analysis that affect our lives, but that have nothing directly to do with our, our personal data. So let me just make that a little bit less abstract and say, for example, let's say a data inference has proved that customers find an accent from upper class area of Barcelona from a female young voice, much more trustworthy than anything else. Then Lord help the ethnic minority who's seeking a job 
uh, who comes from another area or postcode in Barcelona. That person might never even see the job advertisement on the internet and will certainly, if an automated hiring system is being used, never get put in the maybe pile or the yes pile of successful applicants. But that person will never know, will never know that he or she didn't make it to the interview because of this particular influence. So here I, I really am concerned because we as everyday citizens and everyday workers are subject to these influences on a continuous basis and more and more so. And the consequence of this can be, of course, very narrow labor markets, exclusive labor markets, where if you deviate from the norm in any way, you're overweight or, or don't have the, edu ed the education level as the majority, you will be rejected. And this then leads me to the question of, of human rights. Now, these algorithmic profiles, these systems, are of course used to manipulate the choices of, of people, the thoughts of people, the opinions of people. And if we look at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, now this is, and I'm so glad you mentioned this in the beginning, worth celebration. Could we imagine a document as valid, as beautiful even, conducted by our politicians today globally? No, but the world needs the digital human rights sort of act, I would say right now, because these algorithmic influences are manipulating our thoughts, our opinions. Look at Article 18 in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Everyone has the freedom of thought. I would say this is one of the strongest attacks on our freedom of thought and of opinion is this manipulation on who gets an opportunity and who doesn't. So going back to the GDPR, we need much stronger rights as workers, but also as citizens across the world in relation to the, out, uh, the influences that we are subject to. We need to know what they are. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Christina. So um, yeah, taking this from you and before to what uh, Joanna and Alejandro were saying, it looks like we are fighting a lot for digital rights, but we are again like building on uh, historical um, building blocks where we are missing uh, some very important bits here. So do you think that... Uh, currently unions and uh, the management have the necessary competences to fill these gaps? And if not, which I assume will be your answer, <laughs> what should be done in order to, to really like build better, you know, digital rights? Mm. Yeah, see, and that is such an important question because Everybody on this call and listening to this above the age of 40, let's, you know, hand in heart, hand on heart here, we have slipped walked into this situation we're currently in. We never really wondered, you know, we were all enthused that first we got color mobile phone screens and then we got these apps and then came all of these services and they were all free and we never stopped to ask, how could they be free? And now we realize that we're paying with our data, but in general terms, the digital literacy amongst the, the populace, amongst those who do not work in this field is very, very low because they have never been taught otherwise. And the same goes with management. So workers and management, if management at all govern these technologies is from a risk perspective, risk of being hacked, risk of, of data leakage, but never from a social technical point of view, mm -hmm. never from a human rights or workers' rights point of view, never from discrimination and bias, uh, mm -hmm. which is so um, um, horribly felt by, by certain groups. So we need to capacity build both the workers so they know how to defend their rights in this digital age, and we need to capacity build managers so they know how to govern the systems that they are deploying. And this links me, if I may, to just an addition I would have loved to have seen in, in the charter. 
And that is there's a growing body uh, of activism around what we call participatory uh, algorithm design. And that is where uh, any algorithmic system is jointly defined by its, its purpose. What, what should this system do? Do we agree on the data sources? Do we agree on, 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 on the actual purpose, of course, but also the road there? What instructions, so to speak, are given to the algorithm? What can the data not be used for? Should it disappear and be deleted after a certain amount of time, et cetera? And here, although you allude to it in the charter, I would have loved to have seen that the participatory design of these algorithms is an obligation and that it should be in workplaces as well as in public spaces um, that are covered, for example, by your charter. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Christina. So this is very interesting because we might be working on digital rights charters, but we also need to align that with this capacity mm -hmm. building from both sides, from Absolutely. the different stakeholders. Mm -hmm. And also I know that uh, like algorithmic ethics is a, is a big thing, it's on the table. So the more empowered we are as citizens, the more yeah. capacity we have to um, tackle yeah. these issues. Yeah. So thank you so much, Christina. I'd like to pass on to our fourth, uh, last but not least a panelist, uh, Christian Lavo. Christian is a very renowned human rights activist for people with functional diversity an entrepreneur who has created two startups in the field. He has advised the government of Catalonia, the Barcelona City Council, and the Association of Micro, Small, and Medium-Sized Enterprises in Catalonia. And he has worked with the third sector entities and is part of the Social Council of the Autonomous University of Barcelona. He is head of research, development, and innovation at ECOM, Christian, be very welcome. We've talked about a lot about like different initiatives today and we've seen that uh, perhaps we are, we are putting at risk uh, some, some issues that we must uh, put on the table. Why can the digital sphere be either an opportunity or a risk uh, uh, to people with functional diversity, Christian? Thank you very much, and uh, it's a very good opportunity to be here and a honor for me. Uh, first, I have to give my apologies because my English is not perfect, sorry. Um, and first, um, in, uh, the digital era could be an opportunity or a race for the people with functional diversity because we maybe doesn't know how is the inequality with this collective. We, we don't have resources. Uh, we don't have resources in order to pay the different connections or devices in order to pay uh, different capacitation for trainings. And, and it's, 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 these barriers is more, there are more, uh, there are more gap in our collective than the another collective. In fact, to be here for me, it's a very uh, difficult um, moment because my age is in the past and, and, and these questions, but it's important because um, if, if I don't say that all the process, all the projects, all the, all the initiatives that doesn't um, pay attention in us, uh, they are excluding us. So for this, that could be a, a very great risk uh, to improve the society, to improve the, 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 the resources of the, of the own community, forgetting our reality. And that could be interesting, pay attention in our collective, not only for us, because if you are, uh, paying attention in us, you are paying attention in all the people that they have barriers. So, so if you want to improve your society, it's important to 
pay attention in all the people that are living in your territory. And Catalonia has uh, this this culture in the in their DNA. Thank you so much, Christian, and double thank you, Dan, for your efforts to be here. And uh, well, yes, I mean, we're here not to exclude anyone. I think we're all here to work for, for digital rights as, um, how would I say it, as, as the unlocking power to unlock the full potential of, of the digital revolution. So, um, Christian, given that you are here, so tell us, um, what initiatives, what measures, what projects, what uh, what what things you you would you would like to ask or you think that should be taken into account in order to um, uh, guarantee um, the right to access to the digital era to people with uh, functional diversity? What specific actions we should all be taking into account in our day to day? Mm -hmm. One of the most important is to be to be part in the design and development of the process. For example, in the digital rights charter, um, we 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 were I, I was a member of this uh, uh, project, and I, I in, in 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 that moment I could say what we need, not only me, or the the different people of the collective. If if you are in, if you are part of the project, it's impossible to forget yourself. So this is the the very most important thing. Um, I think that it's it's important not only to make a um, evaluation a, a, an evaluation. It's important to give resources to team works specially site in functional diversity with people with functional diversity. Um, if if you are working, if you you have if you have a work plan, do, yeah, and the resources to develop this work plan, you are able to uh, create benefits, social benefits, to your country, to your territory. Do do you have to be confident to 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 trust in your people, and and put in value their life experience. So if you do that, you will improve your society. For me, this is a very most important thing. Uh, and not only to make this work plan and make it for, for the government, uh, you you have to put in value this, this work to all the society, not, no, don't be, don't be shy uh, to, to export this work to another territories. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Christian. So um, we are embracing diversity and we are embracing everyone into the process. I mean, digital, what's different uh, from, from other processes and from, from other like developments of the humankind is that we have all these digital tools uh, on the table to, to further and to reach our objectives. So I'm opening this question to all four panelists and also taking the chance to um, hear to the questions and reflections that uh, the audience uh, wants to share. What would you like in each of your um, areas, Joanna, Cristina, uh, Christian, Alejandro, what, what would you like to happen in the next, let's say five, 10 years? Um, related to digital rights, Joanna, digital society, what's what you'd like to happen? I think that definitely we need to fight against, it should sound like, um, well, against the digital gap, okay? I mean, but in, I said before in, in three ways, the first of all for me is in the, in a physical way, I mean, you should be able to be connected um, from everywhere, okay? From everywhere on the on the planet. Uh, it should could be by earth, by, you know, using cable or I don't know, whatever. It, 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 there is a, a, there are a lot of ways 
to get um, uh, connect connectivity to citizens. But for me, this is the first one, uh, universal access to internet. Because if we don't have this access, we are increasing the, you know, the different, well, we are playing different ways in different rules. So we need to, to give uh, opportunities to everyone and no matter where you live. For me, this is the first one. And then also to give the opportunity to, uh, to citizens to be trained on digital skills, but in two ways. And the first of all, I mean, in the, for the regular life, I mean, for the living, okay? You need to be able to get your, I don't know, your COVID passport to, you know, to attend in a school meeting, to make some kind of process with your city hall. This is one, for me, one, one question. But the other one is uh, how, how can we work for having more people involved in, in the digital sector? I mean, as a worker or, entrepren or entrepreneur or whatever, but in the business, in, you know, in the business sector, because I think that it will be, I don't, how can I say, uh, digital sector will be one of the, for me, the most important sectors for rising, you know, on the next years. And we need people to work, working on that. People from around and diverse people, not just men, you know, white men. We need to, to get more different kind of people in this, in this sector because they need, I mean, they, the sector needs our different point of views, but also as a, People, uh, I think that it's amazing to work on, on this sector and we need to, you know, to, to make people love this sector. Bring this amazingness to everyone. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Alejandro, what, what you'd like to happen in the next five, 10 years? Alejandro, you are muted. Is it late? Oh no, sorry. Uh, no. Uh, yeah, I was I, I was saying that in, in few, five or ten years for us maybe maybe could be a a, 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 a huge a huge time. No? Um, with, with in in the primer vote, we think uh, action in shorter terms, obviously, uh, with 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 the, with the, with, the, with a very goal a long term goal. In fact. Uh, for, for May uh, of next years, we are promoting and coordinating a public and open citizen consultation of adolescents in Catalonia without going through the filters of a school or youth council. In other words, we will directly summon adolescents to participate in the construction of a photo about their opinions on issues that affect them education, culture, works, digital rights, among others. We have summoned different uh, actors from Catalan life to join in this task. Mm -hmm. We are all, already have the support of Bogdoni, a Catalan company expert in electronic voting, uh, Comisiones Obreras, Workers' Commission, the leading trade on a union force in Spain, an uh, association called SEPS, that's a very important Catalan Association in the field of cultural consumption, among others. Yeah? Um, there is still a long way to go, yeah, maybe many years, but I think we're heading in the right direction. So uh, I, uh, if you, if any of you want to join us, welcome. You, know, you already have your mail. Um, I, I will say in Catalan, tan de bo, in the proper años, als adolescents catalans, uh, seeking more mess activos and uh, and la seva participación cívica. Thank uh, you, Alejandro. So you Alejandro, your Catalan is right. <laughs> for the next five, ten years, is to have a more participatory processes for for adolescents and for the young people to yeah. really like build on their future, which is uh, um, more democratic as well. Thank you. Christina, how? Oh, Maria, I have a wish list that is so long. <laughs> but oh. I will, I will uh, try and boil it down. Number one, uh, our current politicians are standing on the shoulders of giants. Just look at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. 
all the world is looking at them now to take responsibility. So my first wish would be a global or actually a set of, of global uh, conventions uh, related to digitalization that importantly subordinate digital technologies to the need of our planet and our people. Profit under planet and people. Look at the catastrophic COP26. Imagine how we could tap into the potentials of digital technologies to actually do something our politicians uh, are failing us with. On the digital divides, which I thoroughly and wholeheartedly agree, if we look to the developing economies, we have a total lack of public sector funding in relation to helping them build their digital infrastructures, i.e. we're leaving the space for Facebook or Meta, as they call themselves now, Google, Amazon, and the rest of them to really digitally colonialize the developing countries. This is a catastrophe. Uh, so I would also want to see more public funding towards our brothers and sisters in the global south. I then want to ban markets in human futures, as Shuzana Suboff calls them, i.e. the trading in data sets of profiles of people which are having such real effects on their life and career or work opportunities. And then lastly, I, I really, really want all digital systems to be able to be vetted Gone is this black box talk of, oh, we don't know how we reach this system. Gone is the laziness of those who are deploying these systems. Accountability, responsibility, and liability must be upheld to the highest, highest of levels. And my last wish is that we actually read the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and put that into a digital context and honor the rights and equality of all. Thank you so much, Christina. I was taking notes of all your wish list. Let's hope this is this is a good occasion, like on the Internet Governance Forum, to do all these wish lists. And Christian, what uh, what's your wish list? What you'd like to happen in the next five to ten years? My wish list is to create protocols. Uh, um, with the participation of the collective in order to include data needs. Um, my another wish is to create a teamwork and, and as in Catalonia, to boost and to understand this territory like a, a lab in order to boost this experience to another countries. Uh, for us, uh, with, the, with the functional diversity, focus um, in order to include our collective intent in the digital era. And no more, no more wishes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Christian. So adding also this um, collaborative approach also with other territories and other countries. Um, I would like to open the floor to all of you. Like, would you like to make some questions to the other panelists or um, are now, I don't know whether we've got some questions from the audience, but Christina, Joanna, Alejandro, Christian, if you have questions for any of you, yeah. I'd like, I'd like to, to talk to Christina. She talked about how can we make some, you know, policies about that. And I'm not a politician, but I'm working on the public sector. And of course, my boss, he's a politician, right? <laughs> and yeah, and when we were thinking on this charter, okay, we had some, we wanted to invite to every entity or institution, I mean, not public, but you know, civil uh, institutions to work with us. And there was a kind of stopper, stop it, because they saw us as a public institution and all things related to, it seems like all things related to public was like, you know, uh, but I don't know how to explain, but it was very difficult for us to involve all these kind of institutions or entities. In fact, we, we, we got them, okay, we got them on the, on the charter, but they were like, if this is a politician question, we won't be on that because we want to be, 
on your, you know, next to you, because mm. we want to, well, to be, um, you know, independent of someone, mm. and we don't want to. In Catalan, we say to get uh, to get uh, mojarte, como dirías, Maria? Yeah. How do you say? Sí, sí, comprendo. Ah, sí. To, to so be was the, or, or to be in the picture next to the government. Yes, they want to be in the picture with us, and we want them on the picture because. We want to change the governance, govern, you know, the governance of this kind of poly policies, but it's very difficult because they saw us, they see us as a politicians because, of course, they are politicians, but we want to change that. And I don't know how to involve this kind of, of institutions. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, that, that's a great, and there's a long explanation to that, probably, and, and I would maybe pin that down to a question of generalized trust between the, the NGOs or civil yeah. society organizations yeah. and politicians in Spain and the history yeah. of that, right? But uh, if, we, if we looked aside that for a minute, I think what is working in many areas of the world where, where I'm uh, active right now is the question of democracy, democratic yeah. participation, how that we dare name the threats to democracy that, that these digital technologies and the current digital ethos is posing and how that we humbly are saying that we are having to go down a new path and form a new ethos. And the best way we can do that is with this multiple voices around the table where the government is just one party on an equal level to uh, everybody else. And I think this is, um, this is really uh, echoing uh, the needs, I think, of many citizens, that this is very humbly put on the table as an urgent matter of defending yeah. democracy. I agree, it's a, it's a matter of trap, of trap, of, mm. you know, how to, yeah, how to be, how to, well, to have to be more between us more you know to work together not yeah. against us but together yeah, yeah. I, I mean don't know you know it's very I, easy just to oppose yeah. and not contribute uh, I don't know how someone has to lead in, in you know uh, in in one point someone I don't know who someone has to lead this because if you are you know working together sometimes you need to just to make some you know some policy or something that you need yeah. to put on the table and you can be asking, I arguing and discussing and, but in sometimes you need to say, okay, I go with this, you know, straight on. And, and if we, we do that as a, I'm not a politician, as I said, but if you do that as a, as a government, sometimes, uh, you know, people don't trust us or I, I know why, yeah, but. No. Mm -hmm. That's a, probably a question of speed as well, right? Uh, yeah. You know, I think if you teamed up with some of the strong unions in Spain, CCO, yeah. uh, if you teamed up with Amnesty, if you teamed up with some of the strong NGOs and really gave it the time, yeah. uh, then then it would be possible. I'd be happy to, to support okay. you in all of that. I think that as, as Christina was saying in one of her um, wish list points, um, that you'd aim for a set of global conventions on digitalization and on how this should be developed. So really bringing into um, uh, the floor the importance of this multi-stakeholder and multi-level like yeah. um, cooperation in order to, to really um, change how things are being developed right now. But Maria, can I say something there then? Because what is happening at the moment is everybody is waiting for everybody else to make a move. Exactly. Right? Yeah. I was saying that. <laughs> yeah. But you and your digital charter is is a very, very important step forward. Actually, believe it or not, who would have thought the UK government came out yesterday or was it the day before with an algorithmic assessment tool, which is looking really, really promising. But so there are attempts, and I think it's important that somebody dares name inside the United Nations, inside the OECD, we need governmental commitment. Mm -hmm. uh, and because this, this is lacking and, and we cannot afford to play this waiting game uh, much longer. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think we have some questions are now from the audience. Yeah, just a couple of questions. Uh, 
right about related to that last uh, thing uh, Christina was commenting, uh, this forum is about uh, internet governance uh, to you, uh, not only Christina, to you all in the in the table. What should be the internet gov governance model? Uh, it's about that, and eh? we're all talking about that, but specifically, can we be uh, more concrete about that? It's very difficult to answer this question, Maria. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Arnau. Um, was this intended for someone or? Um... Open table. Open table, okay. Can I uh, suggest a couple of things? Uh, I just gave a speech this week at the Athens Roundtable on AI and human rights and, and was asked almost the same question. Now, I think we need one, first and foremost, on transparency. We, and this you actually have uh, to a certain extent in your charter, but it should be every citizen's, every worker's right to know what algorithmic systems that they are subject to, what are the instructions to these systems, what rights of, of um, redress do they have? Uh, and uh, on top of that transparency, there should be an open um, repository, so to speak, of, of the assessments of these tools. How have they been assessed according to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights or national human rights legislation, but also uh, other, uh, of course, gender equality or equal opportunities laws uh, and so forth. The, we need that assessment and we need that transparency. That would be number one. And then linked to all of that, there's all sorts of you know human in the loop, human in command stuff, but there should be uh, authorized public authority at a global level, the right to assess these systems, to correct them, to demand uh, that they are opened and unwrapped if harms are being created. And then thirdly, if harms are being experienced by any group in society, these systems should be banned. But there's lots, lots more, there's lots of details and this will never be one convention or one agreement, it will have to be a set. But I think, and this I really want to iterate, we can build them on the Universal Declarations of Human Rights. There's no need to redefine the rights, it's more the means. Maria, maybe, maybe I can share, you know, by, I, I can share the screen and I can share our article where we talk in, in, in the charter about this internet governance model. If you want, I can just can share the screen and I can, I can show to the audience what we are working on, on the charter, okay? Thank you, Joanna. Yes, go ahead. Let me try if I'm able to. Okay, okay. Can you look my screen? Yes, yes, we can see. It. So there is a here, as you can see, as you can see, there is a, an article who talks about an open and inclusive internet governance model. And we are talking um, in things that Christina has taught before. Uh, the internet governance framework should be open, inclusive, responsible, transparent. She, she talked about transparency, okay? Collaborative, interoperable, interoperable and decentralized. We are talking about that. We talk also <clears throat> that everyone should be able to enjoy these self-sovereign digital identities, okay? Then we talk about that the, this internet governance should be based on multi-stakeholderism in equal conditions for free and open internet, that multi-stakeholderism should especially mean considering existing in, in, inequalities in all areas of decision-making, and that stakeholders working with such governance models should foster and warranty, we talk about that, culti diversity and multilingualism. And then there is new, we didn't talk about that, it's probably very important, is that we, we can um, think on a kind of ombudsperson, okay, uh, with a global scope and well, dedicated to these digital rights and responsibilities, okay? And, and But this ombudsperson should be enabled from, from people, from citizens, okay? Not from, you know, from the government. So you can just, I think that are now send a link on the, on the chat, but you can just take a look. This is in English, of course, 
but we are um, our digital chart um, talk about that, and we are including this right as a as a main right. Thank you, Joanna, and that links perfectly to what Christina was saying before. Like um, governments or public authorities should uh, take the lead and also act as a referee for like how these these rights are are being. Uh, deployed. I think we have another question and yes, uh, a question for Alejandro uh, uh, about his Chilean experience and it can be for all of uh, the ones that are in the table. How do you think what we do locally in terms of digital rights affects globally? Digital right affects globally, globally. What we do locally. Ah, locally. Yeah. Well, the, I, I think, it, again, my, uh, I talk uh, uh, from, from, the, from the adolescents no? and, from, and from, from youth and, and, and the youth that, that has not um, right to vote, uh, that, 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 that has a, a lot of obligation and, and, and not too not too not too ma not too many rights, and locally, I think uh, uh, is in, uh, encourage the organization in, in different levels of of, of, of in, in, in the case of my work of adolescents, no? and open spaces uh, in order to they they, they can develop. Uh, there's their uh, there's demands, uh, there's opinions, uh, and and their dreams too. But always from a, a collective perspective. No? Uh, the citizenship is not the, uh, an act of only one person uh, alone. No, by 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 by, by itself or by, by herself or by himself. It's always a, a collective action. No? He, and uh, I think my opinion is that locally um, in the neighbors or in the, or, the, or in the schools in, in case of Catalonia or in, or from the um, from the casal no no, no casal from the, uh, the, the, the 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 organization that already exists is to act together no? to put put um, put in contact. In order to 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 reach uh, and collective goals, what, uh, what collective goals were, we, we don't know. We we we, we must uh, hear to to the adolescents, not 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 uh, the adult world. But I, I think this is the not not it's not a I, I'm not inventing the, the wheel. No, is 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 the way that the, that the Communities um, are stronger in uh, and the social actions, not not necessarily political action, uh, is um, uh, is is, um, is is more is more is, is more strong. No, it's more strong. Uh, well, that, that that that's the that the idea of, uh, of El Meo Primer Vote, no? The my first the uh, my first vote, is is uh, is open spaces, no? Uh, fill fill bridges from this uh, local uh, and very little organization to to the to to, to the bigger levels. Uh, Big, bigger levels, uh, maybe in, 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 in a, a small town or in a city or in a neighborhood or in a country. Not but but I think, I I, I think that the technology is well, it's obvious. You no, know, it's, it's, it's it's a complement in, in in this case. You no, know, in this specific case of of, of participation of adolescents, uh, it's a complement. The, the in fact, the adolescents already. Already knows uh, how to manage their their technology more than all of us. <laughs> they, they, they they have PhD in, in in technology use. So technology for 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 a kid of ten years or twelve or thirteen or fourteen is transparent. No, it's, 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 they, they 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 were they were born. 
So uh, I think the, 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 our, our task uh, is, uh, is open spaces and leave the power, no? not, not leave the power in others. No? Uh, I think, well, Catalonia has the, the last pass is, is, uh, ha, have been, have been, um, has been uh, walking uh, uh, a path in in that in that uh, in that center no? in that in that direction no smaller uh, against the big structure I think it's it's, it's like always like uh, the men uh, has to, men you know women and has to uh, uh, com uh, talk with others and organize and organize themselves. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Alejandro. Sorry, so, sorry but, well, but because my, my English is... No, you, your English is perfect, Alejandro, and so is yours, Christian. You were both saying your English. No, no, everyone's English here is perfect, and we are so lucky we can communicate yeah, in, in different languages. So yeah. um, thank you so much. I think, do you have any other question or points that you'd like to raise and... Um, I see that, I think that there's a question, another question. Well, if you um, have any other uh, question, Christian, Alejandro, Cristina, Joanna, otherwise I think we will be, okay, I think we will be. Just a question, Maria. And we didn't talk so much about that. And I think that we we should work and in things related to the labor or you know the work work on this new era. We we've talked, but I think that it will be one of the main topics these next years. And things related to home working and telework and all things, all, all these things and different kinds of um, jobs and I think that it will be one of the main topics on the table this next year and I think that um, as a government or as a you know as NGO or social uh, entities we will we will have to we will be uh, it will be mandatory to to debate on that because I think that it will change uh, at a lot of things how, how we work of course but how we you know but for me it's uh, the main topic to talk about in, in, in a few, in a few, I mean, next year, maybe in a few years, next year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. I, I, I don't know now what, uh, what are the numbers, but a lot of the jobs that will be in place in, in 10 yeah. years time do not exist yet and are basically related to digitalization and to AI and to blockchain and Christina. Yeah, that's right. Uh, but can I also just put a critical word on this almost fetish, if I can ever say that word, fetishism of skills. A lot of politicians want to boil down the future of work to a question of the right skills. And then they're all jumping onto the bandwagon of ICT, you know, information communication technologies and STEM and so forth. Now, if you think about it, some of the most automatable skills are those inside STEM, so science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. What I really urge all governments to do is to, to encourage, of course, the diversity of skills, but also creativity, culture, yeah. music, yeah. all of these things which, which have been downplayed in, in our Western societies for generations. I think should be upplayed. It is empathy, emotion, complex thinking, and all of that, which are the least automatable and the most human skills. So here, I really want to, you know, push the STEM stuff aside and instead, you know, drum the jungle drums for much more creativity. In fact, we, we talk in Catalonia, I always talk about from STEM to STEAM, because I, I like to wrote this A, but not for art, it's for be, you know, more um, creative, innovative, um, as, you, as you are saying. And because I think that it's a, 
way for getting more women and more girls involved on the STEM without A. Because when you are, when we are sent, you know, selling some kind of studies in STEM, if we just make being the, the, these studies more artistic or more creative or more innovative, putting this A, there are more too much, too many women or girls that are that, that are going to this kind of studies. So I think that we need to 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 break this stem, you know, this this idea that in uh, that um, people who's working on science, technology, engineering, mathematics, they are like you know very you know uh, quadriculados. I don't know the word in English, um, square, you know. Mm -hmm. And we need to put this A that it's more to be more you know to have more right hand and be more creative. And this is the way for having more women. I'm sure about that. So yeah, I met one no. thing, right? And then we have from history the strong link yeah, between course, physics yeah. and music, for yes. example, yes. mathematics yes. and music. No, exactly. I I really think let's teach our children yes, yes. Uh, yeah. culture and creativity. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Noting that too. And um, okay, I think we're like running out of time. So like very, very quickly to um, close and to thank you all for your uh, very valuable contributions and for being here today. It's been a pleasure to host uh, this session uh, by the government of Catalonia with the Internet Governance Forum on um, digital rights and responsibilities for, from local to global and covering like a lot of aspects. I think what we're taking uh, from this session is that we all want, um, we aim for a universal declaration of digital human rights, hopefully in the next five years, not so 10 years, let's, let's aim for the next um, five years and warranting universal access to the internet and universal digital education that uh, takes into account capacity building both for citizens and for those who are generating um, the digital tools like corporations, companies, governments, etc. as to prevent algorithmic influence and manipulation and also um, to tackle the fact that we are now leaving some parts of population behind. So how do we bring on everyone into the change? So we must promote that we have enough resources, enough, enough capabilities and capacities to, to face the digital revolution. And we must be accountable, responsible, and liable to all the changes. We have this endeavor um, we get it from the government of Catalonia. And I think that Joanna, you have a lot of homework to do right from this session, but with a lot of great ideas from all of our panelists. So thank you everyone for being here. Thank you, Cristina. Thank you, Alejandro. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you so much, Arnau, for your help in moderating the session. And thanks to the IGF and everyone attending the panel. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Take good care. Be safe. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you to everyone. Thank you. Thank you.